Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Sockedge James Ward. He belongs to the Wolf Clan. He's Mi'kmaq, or Mi'kmaq Nation, from the community of... Estuobitch. Burnt Church First Nation, New Brunswick. He's the father of nine children, four grandchildren. He resides in... Schlemmel. First Nation, B.C., with his wife Melody Andros and their children. He's a veteran of both the Canadian and American militaries. He finished his military career at the rank of sergeant in an elite airborne unit. He holds a bachelor's degree in political science with a specialization in international relations and a master's of art degree in indigenous governance. He has a long history of advocating and protecting First Nations' inherent responsibilities and freedoms, having spent the last 24 years fighting the government and industry. Having taught, organized, advised, and led various warrior societies from all over Turtle Island down into Guatemala and Borique, Puerto Rico, Sakej has made warriorhood his way of life. He's been on over a dozen warrior operations and countless protest actions. He dedicates all his time to developing warrior teachings and instructing warrior societies from all over. So, first off, thank you for your tremendous work, and second, thank you for being on the program. Thanks for having me. So, when you talk about warriors, what, what is a warrior society? That's actually a, a pretty long teaching. Um, and normally when we do this, let's say we have uh, new warriors coming in that, or people that are just learning comers, that teaching can go on for days. Now, I remember one time um, trying to do this and speak about it and, and abbreviate it and summarize it, and it took eight hours. So um, let's try to do this in a, a few minutes. So um, I would begin by saying before we can speak about warriors, we have to be able to, or before we speak about warriors, we have to speak about warriors. But before that, we have to talk about respons- uh, sacred responsibility, um, creation, and that brings us to the beginning. Um, and what I mean by that, I really mean the beginning, the, the, the concept of creation of our world. And it's at that point where we'll start to understand where the world of warrior comes from. So let me, let me kind of nail a few points here so you understand what I'm saying when I talk about this, because we are speaking in English, and this language doesn't capture indigenous meanings very well, because it's a noun-based language, and ours are usually verb-based. So it creates a very uh, a large distinction in meaning. So let me start with the, the word uh, creator or creation. Um, I think a lot of people carry over the European or Western dominant view of what we think of the divine. And we personify it, because that's the Christian influence. We personify the concept of the divine. Uh, and for most, and I can't speak for all of these nations, most that I know of, uh, the divine, or what we refer to as the sacred, is uh, more of a, a force, a life force, than it is a person. And to give you an example, like in my language, when we say the word creation, uh, we don't say a word that, uh, that speaks to a creator, a person, but creation is gisuk. And gisuk is, means you were created. So it speaks to an act, an action, as opposed to a, a, a person. So we have to start with that because creation is a life force. And from an indigenous worldview, we see a life force in everything. So whether we're talking about people, um, animals, birds, fish, um, even things like the mountains, the rivers, the land, the wind, all of these have an element of a life force. I think sometimes it, it, it would be tempting to simplify it and say, oh, you just mean the spirit. But it's more than that. It's, it's definitely more than that. The spirit speaks more to kind of the personality or the character of the thing, whereas the life force is the energy of it. Um, but if we can get the idea that from an indigenous point of view, this world is in effect a, a, a sacred paradise or a spiritual paradise, meaning I can look outside and I can appreciate that the trees in front of me have a life force. The animals have a life force. The ground itself has a life force. And it, it creates a, I guess, a perception that we see the world as a paradise, as opposed to, now in contrast to this for a moment, say with um, European Christianity, where 
the trees, the mountains, um, even to some degree, we would even say like the animals don't really have this idea of a spirit. Uh, and that puts us in a different place. Our minds go to a place where we don't feel we have to have a relationship with an object as opposed to a subject. And it's, it's really unfortunate because, at least from my point of view, the way you look at the world through that lens, you see everything as an object, which is easy in, to turn into a commodity later. From an indigenous point of view, it has a spiritual life force, so that means you can have a relationship with it. It is a, it's another subject that you can have the ability to uh, learn something from and, and have relations to. So, if, if we can understand it from the indigenous eyes, the world is filled with life. Um, and it was filled with life before humans ever came. So when we were created uh, for many indigenous nations, we understand that like, we're the, the little brothers, the little sisters in the world, that all life was here before us. And we have to be able to learn to humble ourselves and relate to that life in such a way that we are willing to learn. We're, we're, we're willing to learn something from, say, the raven, from the eagle, uh, learn something from the wolf, there's something that bears. They were all here before us. They understand the world better than we do. And it's very, exactly at the core of that is the idea of learning and relating. And we have to learn the lessons of proper relationships. And I think when I say that, it can, it, the, the idea can get lost pretty quick. But when I say proper relationships, what I'm talking about are mutually beneficial, non-dominant, non-exploitive uh, ways of relating to the world around us. And as, as I was saying, that means the animals, that means the land, that means um, the bugs, the birds, everything around us. We have to learn to be in a relationship that's mutually beneficial. So what that speaks to is the idea that relationships are at the core of indigenous worldviews. And the idea of having the proper teachings to know how to relate to the animals in the world around you, is what starts to create a relationship that is mutually beneficial. Because once we learn to have these relationships, we learn to respect and revere the land and all life in it. And when you learn to do that, you, you put boundaries, you put restrictions, limitations on your desires and wants. So, for instance, if I need to go out and, um, say, take a moose or to feed my family, I'm not going to be tempted to take 10 or 20 just because I can. I'll have a, uh, I have a sense of respect and reverence and thankfulness for that particular moose. And all I need is just that one for, my, for the life of my family to continue. So there is, a, in effect, a very powerful social norm that is created around this relationship. Uh, a good friend of mine, he's a professor at UBC up here in Vancouver, and, uh, Glenn Cuthard. He makes references, and he calls it place-based ethics. Um, and he, he talks about the idea of uh, reciprocating obligations. And what he's getting at is, in a good, healthy relationship, you uh, it's, it's mutual, meaning you're both giving and taking, back and forth. And you're respecting each other as much as you can in doing so. So we, we learn about reciprocity. We learn about the idea that we take something and we give something back. And this is how you create sustainable relationships, relationships that go on and on and on. Now, in society, I'm going to, again, I'm going to contrast this a little bit. In society, what we see are dominating exploitive relationships where there's a power imbalance in that particular power, let's say a corporation or the state itself, um, centers itself at a point where it dominates and exploits all others, including the land, including the animals, and the people all around them. So at some point, the exploitation runs out. And at some point, there, there's, there's an end or, or a very bitter end to that exploitation. And it, uh, the relationship is non-sustainable. Maybe you over-harvest, you, you've, um, you've taken too much fish, you've taken too much uh, wildlife, or you've taken too much out of the soil, causing, causing soil depletion. So there is a bad relationship there. Um, so at the core of our teachings is the idea of how to maintain the sustainable relationship with the world all around us. And that's why relationships become so important. Now, in the very beginning, 
a lot of Indigenous nations have what, what they refer to as the original instructions. I think I've also heard them, I've heard them referred to as the divine instructions or the sacred instructions. And what we're talking about are the very first set of teachings we received from creation. And those teachings were about our place, uh, meaning our position uh, within the natural world. And we had to understand that as humans, we're going to carry the responsibility to take care of the land. And it's not just to take care of it for itself, so that way I could just go ahead and hoard everything and, and gather and accumulate with no end. We have to take care of it for the next seven generations. So that places your mind in, in a different frame of thinking. When you go to conduct any, so, any uh, form of um, harvesting, um, whether it's an animal or a plant, you're doing so in such a way that you make sure the, that species can continue to go on. You want to make sure that species will be there for, the, for those next upcoming seven generations. So it puts the brakes on your ability to um, just massively accumulate and you just continuously to hoard, hoard, hoard for the sake of wealth. There is a serious, uh, or I don't even say what a social norm, there is a, a sacred uh, obligation that compels us to make sure this is how we relate to the world around us. We're always thinking about the next seven generations and ensuring that they're going to inherit the world in as good as a condition that we got it, or if not, better. And I think that definitely speaks to the modern era where we are inheriting, inheriting a, a world that has been already severely damaged um, and it faces destruction. So not only do we have to put, uh, put a stop to that, we have to think about how do we improve upon it so that my kids and their kids and their grandkids will start to see the betterment of the environment uh, of the world around them. But in this idea of protecting the world, uh, or protecting the, the land they're on, um, I think a lot of times it's likened to the principle of stewardship. And again, using English words are hard to, to, to capture the full scope of the definition. Um, but in this case, it, it, it kind of works, and I can kind of work with that, because stewardship means to manage on behalf of someone else. And really what we're saying is someone else is the next seven generations. And we're talking about managing our homelands, our particular parcel of the world around us. So um, for, for indigenous people, there's a lot of norms, or as, as Kosar had said, place-based ethics, uh, values, and norms that emerge from this relationship based on the original instructions. One of those is the idea of protecting. If I have to ensure that I'm gonna hand over uh, my homeland to the next generations, in as good a condition as I got it, it might mean I have to protect it. And that means if there is ever a threat, a danger to the, to the homeland being damaged or destroyed, well then I fail uh, as a warrior in a sense of not being able to hand that over to uh, the next generations in the way I, I received it. So the idea of protecting the homeland becomes the role of warrior. Their job emerges right out of the original instructions. And we refer to that as sacred responsibility. The warrior has the responsibility to protect their homelands so that the, the next seven generations can receive it in a, in a very healthy way. And if you look at our languages, and this is where we kind of divorce ourselves a little or disconnect ourselves from English a little bit. If you look at indigenous languages, it's built right in. So, for instance, the word warrior in my language, in uh, the Mi'kmaq language, is smogness. And it means shield bearer. It, it, it's, it's a suggestion or, or uh, maybe pass on to the description of the role we have, and it's defensive, it's protected, and that's even by a shield bearer. The Mohawks have the word, uh, um, I hope I pronounce this right, rotus bonoidite. And that would mean those who carry the burden. In particular, they're talking about the burden of peace. And that means they have to be protectors. They have to be able to protect the conditions that create the peace that they believe in, and theirs is based on what they call the, the Great Law. Uh, if we look at the Shinami, they have the word Adichida, and the Adichida meant brave hearts. Those are people that had the courage to stand up and fulfill that role, to, be, to go out and, and protect their homeland. And, and keep in mind, you, when I say homeland, I'm not just talking about a political demarcation of a geographic space. I'm talking about 
the life of that homeland. I'm talking about the mountains, the rivers, the, the people, the animals. So when I say homeland, it's obviously in its entirety. And I, and I speak about that one. Um, the Lakota, Nakota, Dakota, uh, and also the Cree use the word Atisita. And it's almost a mirror reflection of the word Gisha. And Itu means brave hearts. Um, if you work your way out here, uh, like for instance, I'm staying on the West Coast, my wife's territory, which is Stalo territory. They have the word Stomish. And that means those that have the responsibility to protect the land and their family's honor, uh, their family's name with honor and discipline. And it's a, it's a really good connection, and a really good way of speaking about it. And I think perhaps the Yaqui of the areas we refer to when we think of like northern Mexico. Um, the Yaqui have a very direct translation, and it means defenders of the Hayakim. And the Hayakim is their homeland. So they have a really, really clear way of explaining exactly what they do. They're defenders, they're protectors. So right built into our language, we can see the role that emerges from fulfilling this sacred responsibility. And that's what it means when we start talking about being a warrior. It isn't just the, the um, indigenous guy carrying the gun, um, maybe in camouflage, maybe with a mask, perhaps he has a feather on his rifle or something. The, the, the media sensation, sensationalized image that we always see. It, it's not so much that's the person, because from that we get the impression this person is very angry, uh, they're, they're violent prone, they're militants, and it's easy to kind of construct that, the idea of extremists or terrorists. But really what we're talking about is this is a person who understands their traditional roles and responsibilities to protecting their homeland. And that's at the core of what it means to be a warrior. A warrior society is really a collection of these people. It is um, a place, like a social institution, where ceremonies, rituals, um, um, gatherings are all conducted for the sense of carrying out that warrior work. It is also a place where the teachings, the knowledge, um, warrior history and legacy and sacred wisdom is housed. It, it, it's a place where uh, warriors are coming together to discuss how best to fulfill that role. So when we speak of warrior societies, that's what we're talking about. And can you talk about your um, your uh, how did how did you end up in that role? I know, for example, that <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I know Jeanette Armstrong, who is an Okanagan writer and activist. She's wonderful, and she, I once asked her when she began doing her work, and she said that in her case, it was actually before she was born because she knew what role she was supposed to take in her community. And was it similar for you, or was that a role that you chose or that chose you later on? Uh, probably both. <laughs> it depends on what perspective you speak from. Uh, but I agree. Uh, our roles can be chosen for us ahead of time. And um, first, I'll, I'll give you a, a, a mind way of, of talking about this. And, and again, I, I, I hope I'm saying this right from the mind context, but as you know, the Mayans were very um, uh, knowledgeable of a cosmological understanding of the world and, and everything around us. And they uh, placed a lot of significance on dates, so much so that they found when you're born um, can have an impact on your role in the world and your life. And it doesn't mean you have to follow. It doesn't mean you don't have a choice. You don't have a free will. It just means that's where your gifts are going to lie. So perhaps it could be leadership. Perhaps it could be a medicine person who is a healer, uh, an artist, uh, a statesman, or in this case, a warrior. Um, so the time that you're born has a real influence on who you probably should become based on those gifts. Um, for me... Uh, mine started very young, meaning I had this desire for uh, a little regimented life, a desire for kind of a martial lifestyle, and it started very young. Like, um, I started probably about seven or eight in martial arts, uh, and later I knew I was enjoying the military. There was no doubt about it in my head. There was never a question, and it was only because I didn't see any other outlet for what later on we recognize as a warrior spirit. Uh, at this time, we're talking like the 
late seventies, early eighties, when I was very young, um, there was no real talk of warrior societies because residential schools here in Canada and boarding schools in the states and the missions in, in Central America had decimated that knowledge. When our people went to the residential school, they don't learn to be a warrior. They don't learn anything about being a warrior. They learn how to be a wage laborer. They learn how to basically um, fit into the uh, capitalist society. They are. They spend more time suppressing and denying indigenous knowledge as a way of transforming us into this, this product of assimilation. So our people had almost lost the concept of the warrior. So when I was young, it, it was almost no talk of it. So in my mind, the logical outlet for this, this energy I had, was to join the military. And at first I joined the Canadian military, and I was a Swiss Canadian militia, and I was like, wow, this is not intense enough for me. So as soon as I was done with high school, and I mean, as soon as I was done the very next morning, um, I hitchhiked into Massachusetts, and then I went and joined, uh, signed up for the, the Army there. And I did five years with the, the American military, and I got out very much the typical abrasive, arrogant, um, really, really centered on uh, my idea of being this military soldier-like person, but in a, in a very negative way. Like every, everybody else to me was treated with disrespect, and I was really in a bad place. But I was very patriotic. I was very much the assimilated indigenous person that Americans can be very proud to have. Uh, but there was a really important moment in my life, and it was a few months out of the military. My uncle was a part of the warrior societies, and they were just starting to reemerge. This is early on when the, the warrior societies were still very young, and this would have been just post um, Oka crisis. So in here in Canada, we had a very big, 1990, had a very big uh, fight with the Canadian government where the Mohawk warriors stood their ground against the Canadian military. And this would have been just after that. So there's suddenly a, a revival of this spirit. There's a pride in this ability to stand up to the colonizer. And my uncle became part of that word side. And this would have been the Micmac word side. And they were protecting a fishery area. It was just, it wasn't even very big, it was like a very small river. And they were protecting it so that the people there could fish according to their cultural ways. And the Canadian government said, absolutely no way. Um, so the warrior side came in and closed it off and protected the people so they could fish. So my uncle asked me, can you come in and can you give us some tips? He said, you're fresh out of the military. Can you give us some tips on what we could do to improve our situation? So I said, sure. You know, I was, I was more than happy to. I went in there and I think for three hours I gave them this briefing on all the things they could do to improve their, their perimeter, the way they conduct themselves, all the protocols going through. And, and I felt like I was trying very hard to really pass on as much of my own personal um, experience I had from the military. But it was very right after that. Uh, I wasn't going to be headed out to the morning, so I had the night to kind of to sit around and self-reflect. And I looked over, and I see the lines in basically the areas cordoned off by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Um, and I'm looking over there, and I'm thinking to myself, wow, just a few months ago, I would have been on the other side of the line. You know, metaphorically speaking, I would have been that uh, defender of the state. And it caused me to ask myself, so what is this? What's the problem? What's the relationship between the Canadian state and the Mi'kmaq people that um, has to come to a, a situation where there's state security forces being brought in against my people for simply fishing according to their own cultural ways? So it planted this little seed of doubt. And it caused me to really think about it. And it took me seven years to get past that. I had to sit there and critique myself for a long period. I was a, uh, I was a walking hypocrite where I had some critiques against colonialism, but at the same time, I still had some of this allegiance to the American institution, American society. But after seven years, I finally came to the end of this journey, this really kind of chaotic personal journey, and really understood that I was born to be Mi'kmaq. And as an indigenous person, I have a certain way of being, meaning I have a certain worldview, I have a certain belief system, I have a certain way of relating to the world around me, and particularly my homeland. And that's really what emerged from that was the understanding of what my role should have been right from the very beginning. I shouldn't have had to fulfill my role as warrior by pursuing colonial armies. I really should have had the opportunity 
to fulfill my warrior spirit by joining a, becoming a warrior and joining a warrior society, and that would have been much more uh, culturally appropriate for it to happen. So now, um, I recognize from that point that that was it. That, this is what I needed to be doing with the rest of my life, and pretty much all my training and, and, and uh, university education was constantly about fulfilling this role. How do I better myself so I could be an instrument to protect uh, my people's homeland? So I would like to, to talk more about that in a moment, but I want to step back to what you just said about taking seven years to transform, and that reminds me of something that so many indigenous people have said to me over the decades, which is that in many ways the first and most important thing that we have to do is to decolonize our hearts and minds. And it, it so was that that process that you were going through, is that process of decolonizing, is that what, is that what a lot of people are talking about? That's exactly it. And mine was, um, it probably shouldn't have to have gone that long, but uh, I'm quite stubborn. So uh, there was very much an internal conflict going on where I didn't want to let go of foundational pillars, I guess, of worldviews of Western society that were ingrained and imposed on me as a child. Um, it was hard for me to let these things go because so much of my character was made up on the idea that I, I want to stand on principle. And I, I won't compromise. I won't give in when I know something is right. So what happens when your spirit and your mind is in a conflict of, of trying to decide what is it, what is right that you're going to stand up for? Uh, and for me, it was seven years, and that's exactly it. That's the decolonization process. Um, some people don't take as long. Uh, mine was also self-guided, meaning that if a, an indigenous person has the guidance of uh, people that are very traditional or spiritual people, it, it becomes a, a perhaps a quicker process, an easier process, because you have somebody to speak to, somebody to help give you, keep you on that path. For me, it was a it was a self exploration. It was a, a self teaching. I just I just want I actually immerse myself in in writings and in, in, um, books or whatever I can find around. Uh, decolonization and then go into my own people and turn into elders and search for people to learn more about who I was supposed to be, what are our cultural ways, and what is the spiritual meaning of this idea of warrior. So it, it is not easy and it's very different for everybody. Everybody has a different version of what happens to them on their own personal decolonization journey. So I want to come back to the larger warrior society question in a moment, but I want to ask one more thing about this because I think it's really important that that so many people, and and we, I mean, I can't speak of you, but I have done the same thing myself where I've gone up to the edge of starting to break away and then I haven't, or I've gone up to the edge and broke, again, gone up to the edge and start to break away. What was it about you and that moment of seeing that you were on you could have been on the other side just a few weeks before what was it that helped set you on that journey and what can you say to other people to help give them the courage to to if they're at that crossroads where they can look and say wow I would have been just over there but it's so easy to fall back what 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 can you say to other people to help give them the courage to make that journey too I, I could probably speak from two different uh, ways of this. One, which is more on a personal level for me, I think there was definitely spiritual encouragement. I really feel like something was urging me on that I wouldn't be able to explain. Uh, there was definitely something there. Perhaps it's, it's the ancestors giving me a little smack in the head and trying to get me on the right path. But on another level, if you look at um, uh, Francis Fernand's writings, uh, he speaks about this idea that when people have been colonized, and this isn't just indigenous people, you know, people of Europe have been colonized also and, and carried around imperial ways of looking at the world. Uh, they have their own indigenous beliefs that reconnect them back to their homelands and, and a worldview that I am very sure speaks to the idea of how to physically and spiritually connect within our life with their homelands. But as colonized people, uh, we internalize colonialism. We, we hear the message of the colonizer or this imperial power that somehow uh, degrades us, somehow puts us down, somehow makes us feel we are less than, so that way we don't question colonial authority. So Francis Fernand um, speaks to the idea that one of the most important things to do 
in terms of breaking away and really truly de decolonizing is to fight. And, you know, obviously, you know anything about you know, the history of France and Iran and the, the Algiers war with France, he was meant to fight. And what he says is, you are shedding these colonized negative images that were imposed on you that you feel are, are somehow a part of your identity that shouldn't be. And you are starting to fight against these images, you're fighting against these stereotypes, you're fighting against these character traits that were imposed upon you. And as you do, you're starting to empower yourself. You're starting to become more entrenched in your own culture, your own identity. Uh, and it becomes more authentic because it comes from a place of the self. And the self can mean you as an individual or, or you as part of the community that has the same uh, cultural belief you do. Um, so he really spoke about fighting. He really spoke about this idea of getting out there. It's only when we take the power back from the colonizer. And that's why it has to be expressed in the form of struggle and fight. It can't be symbolic. It can't be... Um, uh, uh, in, in such a way that's negotiated. He said, you really have to take the power back and the colonizer won't give it back. So you have to fight for it. And when you do, the person that emerges becomes authentic. And it becomes a much more healthier, stronger, psychologically prepared person. Uh, and, and we see this with people who decolonize. They're much healthier, much stronger. So for me, that's exactly what happened. Once I got involved in war societies and I started taking on that role of protecting uh, the homeland, I became incredibly immersed in my personal identity. I became entrenched in my understanding of what it is I'm supposed to be doing. And the person that comes out of this long journey um, becomes much more grounded, much more uh, uh, properly shaped. And I felt, because of that, I felt much more powerful. It is the struggle, it is the fight against the colonizer that frees our minds and prepares us so that we can make these things what we need to. So, and thank you for all that. This is all just amazing stuff and incredibly important. And the, when we talk about fighting back, or when we talk about um, protecting land and protecting communities, this can certainly involve, um, as you said, actual fighting. And can we um, can we talk for a moment about the role of discipline in a warrior society, or the role of discipline in resistance? Sure, because that's I, I think perhaps the reason we're even going to speak about it now is it seems to be lacking. Um, my experience in uh, fighting for indigenous freedoms and responsibilities, as well as being part of many. Um, G20 protests and anti-capitalist uh, style movements and working alongside of anarchists and, and uh, social justice groups. Um, I, I always thought, am I being too critical when I think that they need more discipline, more training? Um, or am I just carrying too much of a military attitude into this? But then I recognize the performance level. And I look at groups that have a sense of discipline that um, can really perform well, even when they're completely outnumbered. And when I say outnumbered, I mean like 50 to 1, in some cases perhaps even 100 to 1. Could they still perform in a way that is still very efficient? And it requires a real strong sense of discipline. And this is what curtails, or, or, or I should say, um, puts up barriers to uh, behaviors that aren't very strategic. So, for instance, perhaps, uh, I'm just going to give a quick uh, uh, hypothetical, perhaps there's a blockade somewhere. Uh, you have a couple of young people that are very enthusiastic, and they get some courage, and they're coming out to help, but they have no discipline. Uh, the minute you're confronted with force, how do they react? Uh, generally, you know, at that point, they want to vent, they want to get mad, they want to express their displeasure with the, the power of the state, the injustices. And in that expression of anger, or, or, or even in another way, in that expression of trying to protect justice, um, it may not be the right time, the right place, or the right manner. Discipline gives us the ability to control our emotions, to have a feeling of emotional, emotional maturity to make better judgments. And I found personally that those who have trained a while and got to understand the, this, I guess, environment of resistance they're in, um, build a sense of discipline. 
and they become much more effective. And to me, that's just key. Uh, a lot of times, I could have people that want to come and help out, and let's say 100 people show up and want to get involved, but they have no training and no discipline. Well, that doesn't help me. I can't do a whole lot with that. I love the fact they want to be a part of it. I really admire their their uh, their spirit and their courage. But without training and discipline, there ain't a whole lot I could do in terms of capability. Um, I, in a way, in the end, I'd rather have like a handful of people that are, are disciplined and trained versus a hundred people that show up just for the sake of numbers. So it, it's not. I'm not trying to you know um, uh, somehow ridicule or, or put down those who haven't had a chance to experience that idea of training and discipline in a resistance movement. But I say it's critical, and this is what will give us the advantage. Uh, right now, we're you know if you're going to stand up against the state, they're outnumbered. There's, there's no question about it. You, there's overwhelming force that you're in front of. And the only way to beat that is to be very effective and be very strategic. And that requires a sense of discipline. And I keep thinking about a couple things. One of them is that basically the, the Ottoman Empire, for about 150 years, they basically lost every battle they fought because this is from the... I don't know, 1740s to 1890s or something like that. It could be off by 100 years. Anyway, there was a certain okay. time that they had a part of their uh, strategic policy was to attack in piecemeal in battles. Okay, and yeah. So basically everybody they fought who did not fight in piecemeal but actually fought in a disciplined manner just stomped them in terms of effectiveness. Yeah. So I'm just, I'm just saying that in terms of one thing from history. Another thing that I've – I remember reading in this one history book one time – this one like staff sergeant said he was talking about how if you don't know how to do it, how difficult it is to – if you have 20 units, 20 military units in one place and you want to actually move them 10 miles, the logistical difficulty of actually figuring out who goes first, figuring out – and you actually have to have an ability to organize even to move them five miles. Do you see what I'm trying to get at? But even on that Absolutely. level, even on that yeah. level, discipline and experience are really important. Absolutely, and this this is why I I feel like I get a lot of um, confidence in warrior societies, in the sense that that's at the core of what we do. We train, we prepare, we we we're constantly working with each other because we understand our role, and we have a concept um, that we refer to as warriorhood, and what that means is. The individual sees being a warrior not just as a, a political military uh, venture. It's also one of internal self-development. We are constantly practicing what we refer to as warrior arts, and those are arts you need to protect your homeland. We're practicing, practicing those in such a way that we're trying to perfect them. And what it does, it's more than simply saying, hey, check it out, I got these really cool tactical skills. What we're really trying to say is, I'm doing the best to seek excellence in everything I do. And the warrior arts are just an expression of that. And it's a way of trying to perfect my character, to try to build up this, this sense of all these things we're talking about. We're talking about maturity, we're talking about courage, we're talking about discipline. I'm trying to build these up in myself because most importantly is our character, not just our skills. So for us, training is at the core of warriorhood and it's at the, tra- it's, it's at the core of everything we do. So when I get into a fight, and I'm going to use an example here, um, Sturgis uh, in, in um, South Dakota, and I believe this would have been about six, seven years ago, uh, the Lakota Warrior Society was protecting a sacred site, Bear Butte. And as you all know, Sturgis is a place where a really big biker rally between 500,000 to a million bikers show up. Well, there was a bar that was trying to expand onto the sacred site. And the... The, there's 47 different indigenous nations that call the Bear Butte uh, uh, a sacred site to them, of uh, varying degrees. So, for instance, the Cheyenne have what they call their seven arrow teachings, come right from Bear Butte. So it's, an, it's arguably perhaps one of the most sacred of all sites in the Americas, or at least North America. Um, so the Lakota warriors were going to protect it, but they were incredibly outnumbered. When you think about the odds of the bikers out there, uh, there was Homeland Security, there was FBI, there was state troopers, uh, National Guards riding around with the state troopers. You think of those numbers, and they're immense. And it was 30 warriors. So what gives these guys, these 30 warriors, the um, 
the ability, the psychological, spiritual ability to to remain true to their responsibility and to feel enough confidence that they can actually win. And this really comes from training, this comes from discipline, this comes from a certain cohesion of working together, and an ability, the ability to carry out an action in a very disciplined way. And we did. We went in and we took the town hall of Sturgis, right in the middle of the Sturgis rally, went right through the bikers, took the town hall, held it for a day, drew in international media attention. And then when we were done, we the warriors encircled all the activists and elders, and we had marched our way out, so seven miles back to their view. And this required an immense amount of discipline because at any point, there could be provocation by bikers, provocation by state troopers. Things could have went bad really, really fast. But the training and the discipline paid off, and in the end, that particular company kind of fell under, and the people have detected their view at that time. So it becomes a good example of what can happen when you really train well and you really focus on that. You have the discipline of the group. So we have about seven minutes left, and okay. I'm going to ask you a question that will take you a lifetime to answer. Okay. Which is, um, given that the dominant culture is insatiable, and given that it is uh, killing everything that anyone holds dear, um, what what do we do? Mm. That needs the answer. Huh? Um, I'm gonna just kind of just speak on the surface level of this because obviously it could be a nice, really long discussion, but. There's probably two things that need to happen first and foremost. And one, or two ways we're approaching this. And one is we can change the minds of the dominant culture. And that means we have to break them away from the Western paradigm. We have to break them away from that incomplete doctrine of thinking about the individual and, and about capitalism and Western democracy, everything that's associated with it. Break them away from that. Stop seeing the world as a commodity and a way of getting rich and, and start to in a way, reawaken the spiritual sense of who they really are. Um, now, that's not, that's not an easy thing to do, obviously. You know, trying to win the hearts and minds of the dominant society that is getting nothing but power and privilege from the way they conduct themselves now to suddenly ask them to make sacrifices and, and stop what they're doing, that's, that's not easy. The other way is to change the relationship. Right now, we're experiencing a relationship of domination and exploitation. And we have to find a way to change that um, only because no amount of words are working right now. No amount of good gestures, no amount of goodwill is working. So what it comes down to is a, a relationship of raw power. And how do you change that imbalance? How do you affect that so that the dominator, the colonizer, um, doesn't feel it has complete, uh, um, so, so that no longer feels like it could exercise complete power over people that there's some kind of obstacle to that. And for me, that's what we're starting to do. That's what we're starting to talk about, uh, building up and and developing that power that starts to address that imbalance. Now, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm no fool about this. I understand that there is still a massive imbalance, even with worried societies. But this can be the beginning. If indigenous people start to go back to our cultures and start to rebuild worried societies, then we can start talking about the ability to have a power that will affect this imbalance in the relationship, and perhaps then we can start talking about how do we start to switch those minds. So really, in the end, we're talking about a combination of those two. But that puts people in a position where I think they uh, they need to rec recognize a few things. And if anybody's thinking about engaging um, in protecting uh, the, the nature, they have to recognize the whole lens that are on. That means recognizing the, the indigenous nation that you, you happen to be occupying. Um, try to find the traditional people that are really trying to make this happen. Because assimilated people will be just brown people that speak with a white intent or European dominant intent. So you have to find traditional people who are still cultural and spiritual. And see how well you can help them. Go there and really try to be a part of that. And see how well you can be part of that resistance that they're doing and protecting their lives. And then we need to empower that side so we can adjust or we can address that imbalance. And I think when we get to that, that we start to see, and I think we are, I'm not going to speak to this in the future terms, we're starting to see people that are from um, non-indigenous uh, society, the dominant society, wanting to become part of what's going on. 
uh, a resistance and attack the homeless. And they're willing to humble themselves and understand that as indigenous people, we're the legitimate governing uh, people and body of these homelands, and they're starting to recognize the, the legitimacy behind that. It's an issue of justice. Right? And a lot of times, you know, when we think about that, and we're saying, listen, um, this is what the relationship that starts to look like now. You can start to be part of it. And we talk about the idea of how do they start to take on this role? What kind of uh, duties are they taking on? And where, where are they going to fit in? And how do they become part of that resistance? And, and it becomes a really, um, I think, exciting time now in the sense that we can probably start to see a good relationship that will take on an effective resistance. And what would a what would an effective resistance we've got a couple minutes left what would an okay. effective resistance look like to you well it's it's a combination of things right it's a it's a spiritual resistance a political resistance the economic resistance um it's a resistance that starts with the self we have to do i guess what che have referred to as a revolutionary person or a revolutionary man that we have to become different than the dominant society and take on different worldviews I think it has to start there, and then we have to start talking about what it means to rebuild these institutions that can address the power, the raw power of colonialism, and start to deter their exercise of power over our lands and people. And really, this is a long-term solution. This is not going to happen in the next five or ten years. Uh, we may see the building of it. We may see little events around it, but I really think it's going to be a long period. But it's only when we get to the point of building those institutions um, of resistance and protection that we can actually say we're going to be addressing the, the relationship that we're going to start to change things. So this has all been incredibly important, I think. And is there are there any last things you want to say to people before we before we end for today? Sure. I I'll, I'll probably start by saying this. Um, this is a long resistance. This is not something brand new. It sounds, because it, the political language is modern, it gives the impression that it's new. For indigenous people here in the Americas, this is 500 years old. This is something that we've, uh, we've been fighting off and on continuously. It just it kind of peaks and wanes, but it's been a continuous resistance for 500 years. And I think it's not just to the better interest of indigenous people, not just to the sake of serving justice, but even in a sense of self-interest and self-preservation, I think it's time dominant society starts thinking about getting on board and, and becoming a part of an indigenous resistance to colonialism and start thinking about protecting these homelands. And to those people who are really thinking about that, the thing I'm going to have to say to them is, welcome to our war. Well, thank you so much for saying that, and thank you for, <clears throat> thank you for your work. I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Sockage Ward. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.